weirdly awesome until we realized we weren't getting power back. And in fact, we had to go take chainsaws and cut um, trees out of the way so that the audience could get home. Oh, that's weird. But that's similar to what happened at that Loggins and Messina concert. They, you know, a couple of stagehands finally showed up from backstage with flashlights and they said, well, we hear this place has really good acoustics. We're going to test it. And they just all came out front, the band and the principals and everybody. And they started to do a concert without any power at all. And they went on for about 15 minutes doing a beautiful job. You could literally hear a pin drop. And then the power came back on, and it was the weirdest combination of happiness and sadness. <laughs> it's like, we've had this lovely little thing happening. And then they had to try to get the energy of the show back up for a regular rock concert. Yeah, that was a... That was a scary thing. I mean, it was a, a derecho, derecho storm, which is one of the big straight wall so storms that come through the, the entire company, country. And so it, it dropped power all up and down the uh, eastern seaboard. What and did you uh, call it? I hadn't derecho. heard that term. Straight derecho. Spanish, derecho. Yeah. Derecho. Yeah. Thank you for that. Greetings and welcome to Office Hours. If you are new here and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, head over to officehours.global. Our first hour, we answer your questions on media and digital productions of all kinds. And our second hour is typically something that we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we'll be talking about the business of theater, how to start, how to grow, or maybe even pivot within the space. And speaking about pivot, Bill, let's get this party started. Absolutely, Liberty. Good morning to, and afternoon and evening to all. Uh, we're going to start with a question from John Fultz in Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania. In the early days of DSLR video, a shutter speed of about two times the frame rate was recommended. With the newer shutterless cameras, is that still a good idea? Bill? Well, back in the day, we had this problem, which was that if the frame rate and the shutters didn't agree at least evenly, you'd get kind of fluttery black bars that would show up in places in your video. And this just had to do with the cadence of the shutter opening and the cadence of the frames going by in the camera. So at least going twice over would mean that a full frame would get exposed every time a picture needed to be grabbed. In the modern era, without shutters and things like that, everything is timed electronically. And typically now, a sensor will read all the light data coming in from the camera, send it off incredibly quickly to a buffer, and you don't have the same kind of problem with mechanical things in front. Now, some cameras still do have that, and shutter speed can still be an important issue depending on how the camera's built. But is it as critical as it used to be to avoid that problem? Not really. The cameras have gotten more sophisticated since then. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and the big problem, I mean, the reason we have shutter speed versus uh, the um, the frame rate is because, you know, as you started to bring frames in, you had to they're 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 being shown. So there's a if you're looking at a at a sensor or at the time it was film, basically what happens is is that you have you have to have a shutter open and close because the frame has to come. This is the frame next frame, and then this is this frame, and then this is the next frame. If you didn't 
close the shutter at some point, you would see motion blur of the frame actually coming into frame. You know, like, you know, the frame is is rolling. And so it had to, as the frame, it, it, the mecha mechanically, the frame was rolling in and rolling out. So you have to have that. So what you would do is if you think about the shutter, the, the frame rate, if this is a frame coming in, a, a shutter speed of half means that the frame has time in here to start and stop. <laughs> so it, it comes in, it's ready to be exposed, the shutter opens, it and then it has time to get out of the out of the frame. The shutter closes and it's, you know, it's exposed. And so that was the challenge there. And and for in World War II, they used 90 degree, which is even smaller, to give that to give it every give the system more time to get in so that it was more robust. Now, that we've gotten used to that's how it looks and it looks natural. We, we've decided that that looks natural. And so um, we still do generally 180 degree uh, or twice the frame rate um, is, is generally what we do. Um, there are times when we don't do that. So for instance, if I'm going to do a 60 frame per second show or 5994 um, or even 5994i, uh, but I'm going to stream at 1080p, I mean, sorry, it's at, at 30 frames a second, I actually want that to be 360 degree. I want to leave it open because it's electronic. It doesn't matter. The reason I want to do that is because it 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 will give me the proper frame rate when I throw half the frames away. Um, the other thing that we're we're finding is is that we at 120 frames per second, it works better at 360 for some reason. It just looks better at 120. It also means that your 60 frame per second is correct, and that it's easier to derive 24 from that 120 frame per second. So there are, it's not a, a hard and fast rule. And sometimes we change that that shutter speed to, a, to handle flickering lights and so on and so forth. You can slow that down a little bit to allow that to happen. So there, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it is something that you wanna pay attention to. Next question. Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York is up next with racking the Sonnet X Mac mini server. Are there any USB connections on the Mac mini that would have to be sacrificed? Again, uh, and he's saying that not able to be used due to the covered enclosure. Go ahead, Richard. Um, Mike, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but um, I can theorize, so apologies for the uh, speculation. Um, the back of the Mac Mini normally has two USB A's and two USB C's. From the look of the uh, the Rack uh, Mini server, there's an extra USB A at the front, which I'm assuming is routing one of those around to the front. And then likely the two USB C's, the two Thunderbolts, will be used for the PCI expansion. Therefore, there might be one that you can't get to very easily, one USB A. Alex? I don't, I don't have the most current one, but I, I, we've used a lot of Sonnet boxes and they definitely have worked around the issue of, of making sure that those are all available to us. So the, the most current one, I'm not sure, but I can tell you in the past, and that one that's routed out front, we've been able to leave that opened and then be able to route something into it. Um, but with the server version, it may they may be um, contained, but generally Sonnet obviously doesn't want to take away your USB connections. And so I think that you're, uh, that would be probably not something that would be um, seen positively. So I have a feeling that it's probably okay. And Bill. And just a little note, because it snapped me about a month and a half ago, I had something plugged in and I couldn't get a picture up uh, into my dock. And when I was talking to the folks at the company, they said, are you plugged into the back or the front USB? And I said, well, in the back. And they said, no, move it to the front. And I went, really? And I thought they were all equivalent. But it turns out there was a little icon next to the one in front indicating that it had more power to it than the USB bus in the back. And so the peripheral I was using would only work if it was plugged into the front. So I've started to look at those little icons more closely than I used to. I would just identify, oh, it's a USB. It's probably just like all the others, and I'll plug into it. Well, it turned out not to be true, and I'm a little more careful about that now. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, when you get this message, the UPS device connected to Synology's NAS has entered battery mode. Eliminate battery time, 61 minutes from Synology's NAS. Should you power down your NAS or wait for the power to return? Go ahead, Alexander. Well, generally with, with a UPS, if I mean, if I'm not doing anything critical, generally I will, it, it, one of the nice things about them is that it allows you to safely turn stuff off. Uh, because what I find is that when the power comes back on, there's usually a quite a large surge. I've had gear die, even hooked up to power conditioners before. So that's just a precaution. The, the problem with power outages too, is you don't know really how long it's gonna last or when exactly it's going to come back. So 
you know, if you have 61 minutes left, that's, that's only an hour and it's not very long. So for me, I always powered my stuff down. Go ahead, Talak. If you have <clears throat> really good information about what the, what, how, how, how long this power outage is going to be, then I would say a third of those 61 minutes um, is all that you are, that you want to ever trust that thing on. So the best thing to do is to, is to shut your equipment down um, if you possibly can. Um, but you, as Alexander said, you never actually have knowledge about how long a power outage will, will go, um, unless it's you who has initiated it. So, um, that's, that's the way I would go is try to shut it down. And Mitchell. Yeah, I agree with everything that's, uh, preceded, uh, uh, being said. Most UPSs, at least in my experience, have been, are not 60 minutes or more like 30 or 20 minutes, maybe even 10, depending on how you're pushing it. But, um, you know, you can have a brownout, you can have a sag, you can have a, an outright uh, a drop. Um, after the first five minutes, it's time to start shutting gear down uh, for the reasons that were just mentioned. And Alex? Yeah, and this is when things that, when, when you're working on something at home and you just have a UPS, you can turn everything down. If you're in a production, this is why we have generators. <laughs> so, so, you know, we have a, we'll have a UPS that's going to manage a certain amount of time, but we then want something that we can run almost indefinitely or indefinitely. Now, sometimes you can't have a generator because you can't, you don't have access to the outside. You don't want to run them inside. So, um, so the, uh, so that you may be just stuck with the UPS. Uh, in most big productions, most outages last less than 20 minutes. But you do want to make sure that when it turns on, and we test this, we unplug those UPSs from the wall and take a look at the, what the time is at the beginning and do exactly what Tlaloc said, which is divide by three and go, that's the amount of time we have. And we want that to be at least 20 minutes. Next question. Next one comes to us from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. And Tony says, Conversations with Tony Mobley is approaching 99 episodes on YouTube this week. Congrats. I have purchased a Samsung T7 SSD solid state drive. What's the best way to download the episode? Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, no, I think Tlaloc was going to answer the actual download part, but I was going to just throw in to make sure... Uh, to when you download, uh, make sure you have a good nomenclature set up uh, so that you can find those files uh, later when you're uh, trying to track down where did I put all of that stuff because they will inevitably get lost in the shuffle and just make sure you have a, a, a set file structure that you, when you start to set up that drive, set up your file structure first. Do you want to give a, a recommendation of what a, what that could look like? Uh actually chris fenwick has a uh very good uh system that he uses but i uh i start with a archive that i i have a different setup for different drives but my general setup is a project folder an archive folder and a uh, file folder and then once you get inside of that then it starts to divide up so that's my awesome tell luck so to actually download a youtube a video <clears throat> onto your computer, there are a number of websites that allow you to do this. <clears throat> um, I think it's a gray area on the terms of service for YouTube. So I think that's why sometimes it they don't they don't stick around these companies that, that allow you to do this. <laughs> so what you need to do is is Google, you know, download YouTube videos. And then what 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 you'll what you'll find is um, a place to put the URL of the YouTube video, and then it'll it'll look at it and see what it can convert it into, and then you can download it from there. Um, and I Y two Mate, I think might be one of them. I can't remember exactly the the names, but I would look at it and um, and then also be cautious because the thing about it is is that um, you know you don't know what you're gonna what you're gonna get from some of these from some of these websites. Richard. Yeah, I would recommend Downey on the Mac. Um, it was re recommended a couple of years back and I've used it ever since for, for my YouTube downloads. Uh, absolutely solid, also brings down the subtitles. Um, but I, if, if I believe you, um, Tony is also the owner of the YouTube account, you can go into the back end onto the Creator Studio and you can download the episodes there without actually having to use an external downloader as well, if you have that access. Good call. Bill? Plus one, everything Richard said. I've been using Downey for about three years now. Before that, I had another one that stopped working because they changed uh, something in the back end. So, yeah, I like that. Bye. 
And just pulling in, Mickey mentions in the chat plus one to the the naming convention, and he also said, "Don't just use any application to download. Most of the most of these give you a re-encoded MP4 output. Get the original VP9." And he also notes that YouTube will only give you the 720p. So just be mindful of that as well. Next question. Alexander Knight and Vancouver, British Columbia here on the panel. Does anyone else on the panel find themselves dismantling their entire office hours set up every six months to rewire everything and optimize? Just six months? Uh, go ahead, Richard. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I try and leave the setup you know, set if I can, unless I'm, uh, I really, really have to, um, or if I get really annoyed with my cable management, um, or if I'm testing something, then I will tend to rip stuff apart. So at the moment I'm testing, um, the DJI, um, RS3 pro. Um, so my camera today is on a gimbal on a tripod instead of being just on a tripod. Um, and that's me just testing it out to, to see. So I had to rip everything apart to try and, uh, build that in, in, in some kind of stable way. So if at some stage today, my camera goes like this, then you'll know what's gone wrong. Thanks for the heads up, Kyle. Uh, I would say yes, but it's more on a, a weekly, if not bi-weekly basis that I change my setup because uh, all of my cameras, uh, when I don't use them here in home studio, I take them out and I go uh, on location and shoot them, uh, shoot with them. Uh, so it's, it's, less about uh, rewiring for cable management and it's more about i have to take all my cameras and tear everything down and put it all back up again so um you just go with it talak yeah i'm right there with you kyle because you know i use my black i have a black magic uh, 6k and i use that for my projection design work a lot um i did on, on this last show i was just working on in maryland and so i need to um, pull that and use it. And, uh, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm recording audio, I use my mix pre, which is also my, uh, my mic, mic interface for what I'm working with here in terms of this show. And so I pull that and change the settings on that. <clears throat> um, and Mickey would say, I still don't know very well how to use it. So every time I do that, I learn how to use it a little tiny bit better. And I have to, um, I consider asking Mickey, uh, w one bit less. And I think that's, that's the goal. Go ahead, Alex. So for, first of all, a question for Richard, uh, can you, what are you controlling? How are you controlling the, uh, RS3? At the moment, I'm just going to do it through my phone. Um, so I'm not doing anything particularly fancy uh, with it. And I've set it to a very slow speed so that I can very manually, very, very gently adjust it and not lose my setup. Mm, and it nice? works really nicely. Um, cause I also have focus control. Um, so, and if I really, really wanted to, I could put the LIDAR onto it and then get autofocus, but there's no way I'm going to do that. Not for, yeah. not for a table setup, but I might do it for something else. I have an RS2 and I was like, oh, I've been thinking about putting it in cause it, you know, cause I was going to get the RS3 and use, actually use it. But I was like, the RS2 is still super useful, but the phone, the phone control works well. It, it does actually, the Bluetooth control works well. Um, in the, in the theater, we have, um, uh, middle things, APCRs, uh, right. which connect into the gimbals as right. well. That would allow us to move it. The nice thing about the pro is that I find it fits and balances the 6k better. Um, and also it should hold the Ursus. So I might yeah. be test it on the Ursa mm -hmm. when I get into the theater. That's good. Um, yeah. And I, about every six months, I'm very, very close. I'm a couple, you know, we have a couple things coming up, so I'll probably wait, but, um, I'm about to tear the whole place apart. I've decided to make even a bigger, I was watching some show yesterday and, and they had a, a bigger fill light. I have a f three by five and I was like, I could really go eight by eight by five. <laughs> so, so that's my next, I'm about to, so that means I have to tear all this out so that I can put up the new fill. So anyway, so that we're going to try that. Go bigger, go know, bigger. It, you can't, it was, it was one of those things that was watching this. Um, there is a great show on Netflix uh, called uh, This Is Pop. And it's uh, it's all behind the scenes, and they have one called the Stockholm Syndrome, which is all about how much impact uh, Sweden has on the pop on pop music in the United States. It's insane, like it's insane how much how many pop hits come out of Sweden. And uh, but they, they had a set of the, the guy was in a set, and he goes, "This is not really a set." And it pulled the camera pulls back and shows just the three walls that are that have been set up in a studio, and it had this giant fill light. And I was like, "No, oh, it's." It's really nice. I think I might want one of those. Go ahead, Alexander. 
Yeah, I appreciate all the comments. This was more, I put this question in because this was more of a, a check to make sure that my uh, my mental health was not declining in any way, that I, this is, this is not just my problem. No, not at all. No, this is, this is the culture here. So you're, you're in the right place. Um, for me, I don't know if it's so much every six months as it is around my travel. So, uh, and I have like one setup, this is like the Mac setup, and then this is the PC setup and also like functionality. So I'm more function than aesthetics. Although thank you to those I've been trying to in studio wise, like let's play around with some lights as well. So mine is more, um, whatever I'm working on and if I'm traveling. So that's, that's how it dictates takes it. Next question. Tony Mobley is back again uh, from noon in Georgia with Tlaloc Lopez Waterman. What is your mobile setup as you come in from multiple locations? Tlaloc? So at this point, my mobile setup um, is my is is kind of my normal setup because I'm always moving and changing locations. And so I, and I need my my 6K for work in terms of projection design captures and things like that. Um, and so uh, I have a rolling um, uh, Pelican case that I have fit my mic, my mix pre, uh, my 6K, uh, as well as um, the time code boxes that I use for when I'm, when I'm actually doing sound, <clears throat> all in one rolling case that can go uh, in an overhead in, 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 the, in the airplane. And then I have a, a, a laptop, a PC laptop that I use, um, and I put all those together to to come on the show. What lens are you using? It's the oh, twenty-five to the sort of typical twenty-five to seventy, I think it is um, okay. lens. Uh, and um, I have an, another re really wide lens, which I thought I would use more, but I found a good deal on it and bought it, but it. It's not very useful. Okay. I mean, for most things. Next question. Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, everyone. What does the panel think of the Kubok, C-U-B-L-O-C-K, power strip? And what power strips and or surge protectors do you all recommend for production? And it looks like this Kubok thing is a Kickstarter. He's got a link to it down there. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, this looked like a really cool little gadget but uh i was like oh yeah that would be neat to be able to plug in that stuff but i have found especially on production nothing beats a good old-fashioned extension cord uh like just being able to plug a thing in and go with it instead of oh i left this module in this place or this thing doesn't plug into that and uh but the other little gadget that I have found is very useful is this little adapter, which has a USB-C and two plugs to like uh, split it a little bit. But it's very pocketable and it's, it fits in my bag really easy. The little uh, gadget that was shown seemed a little bulky to be uh, fit in any of my bags or any of my on-the-go packing. So... Uh, I think it's cool to have around, but like, I'm not sure it would work for production environment. Alex? We started with things like that. It's a pretty version of something that we've had for a long time in, in a variety of different European countries, because a lot of the European countries have that inset, especially in Europe. So you don't see it as much in, in, uh, in the UK, but in Europe, they have a lot of these extensions that have kind of insets, which is great. Um, but we found that, that this is really the Oh, you're on mute. And, and so basically what you have is a, is a, you know, everything fits into that. <laughs> like, so you don't have to have any adapters. Everything works with everything. Um, and I have so many of these. This is all I buy now. Like when I'm, you know, when I buy them, well, when I buy this density, this is what I get. And um, one thing is, is that here, this is a cable. And right now, of course, I'd have to still adapt this, um, you know, for that. But you can get one of these, um, I, I just couldn't find it before the question came up, with a C13 input. So it's literally one of the C13s like you put into your computer. And the reason that that's important is because you can buy that cable anywhere in the world. So what you do is you go to, you, you, you land in France or you land in Italy and you just go, go to every any hardware store, Zimbabwe, you go to any hardware store and they're going to have their local connection to a C13. And then you're going to plug it in there and then you're going to tape it. You know, that's the thing. You, you plug it in there and then you gaff tape it to the to the device so that it doesn't accidentally get pulled out. Um, and now you have that that conversion. But I really, we, 
I think I probably at one point owned like 50 of these because they just, this is what we put in the kits because then we didn't have to think about what country that, that the kit was going to. Yeah, it looks like their claim to fame or what they're doing here is that for people who don't necessarily know where or what kind of outlet that they'll need is that it's modular and that you can switch it. So the, the one like that I have, you just switch it, but it just, you don't, there's no switching. There's just a bunch, there's enough things to go in that almost everything in the world, including South Africa, South Africa, South Africa is the hardest one, <laughs> like, you know, it's because it's giant. And, and so, um, the, the, uh, so anyways. Alexander? Yeah, so I, I like Furman power conditioner products. Those are really good. If you have an unlimited budget, the ultimate thing to get would be a product uh, made by PS Audio. It's a power regenerator. They have a 15 amp and a 20 amp model. And what it is, it is actually takes the power out of the wall and regenerates a completely perfect clean sine wave, clean, totally clean power. They're over $10,000. <laughs> so if you have the money for that, that would be good. Go ahead, Matt. And uh, one of the things to be aware of is uh, you're plugging in a 110 into a European connector is something like a battery charger that's going to uh, have a different pull. We've uh, tripped a number of breakers with people trying to recharge their DeWalt's. And Alex? Sorry, yes, yes. Um, the, the, what I did show, yeah, I think that that was, that was a good, good point out by Matt. Um, what I did show there is something that we assume almost all of our electronic equipment is all 110 to, two, to 240. So it, it, it says, and you want to read it before you put it in. Um, so generally everything that we have is that way. And partially that's the case because we don't, we don't, if something isn't that way, it better be really good or I'm not going to own it. You know, like it's, it's, I kind of like don't want to have something that doesn't cross platform, but, but chargers are one thing that, that get you. The other things that get you are hair dryers, um, bug zappers, like, uh, and, and irons. Those are all things that, that don't like to be uh, multi because they, they're creating heat and then they create a lot more heat than they should. And if you do it in a hotel room, it sets off the alarm, just in case you're wondering. And for our producers, this is a great time for you to those burning questions that you have to submit them and most importantly, to vote on our questions because you, we never know how long some of the answers may take for us to respond and you want to make sure that your questions get answered. Next question. Adrian Allback, um, in b and &E, I'm not sure where that is. Sorry about that. I didn't check it out ahead of time. Follow up to last Friday about video over IP. Looking for a recommendation for a reference book about this. Less than five years old. The best I can find so far is by Gary Olson. Ooh. Bill? Well, I'll take a little shot in it only this way. It's getting tougher and tougher to find books uh, that are that cover both of these things. You know, a novel or a reprint or something like that, that's going to last forever. But technology changes so far that anything like video over IP that is written about um, two years ago or three years ago, which is usually how long it takes for the book to go through its writing, vetting, printing, distribution and everything else process is going to be potentially out of date or at least partially out of date by the time the book actually gets there for sale. Material online obviously can be adapted and corrected closer in real time. So I think it's going to be harder and harder to find references that are in the form of an actual book. And I'm assuming that's what you're looking for. If you're looking for some sort of digital delivered book, then that's a different thing. And those, I think, will continue to be there. Uh, but it takes a long time to produce a book. And boy, in fast-moving technology, that can be a challenge. Alex? Yeah, the books can't keep up anymore, as Bill said. And so you're really better off looking for white papers, uh, web pages, uh, YouTube channels, those types of things. And even those aren't going to be 100% accurate. So you really have to just kind of swath across a lot of those things. One of the things that I have found useful in this area and in other areas is to actually use ChatGPT and ask it the question that you have. It will put it out something that may or may not be 100% accurate, but oftentimes is not is remarkably good. But it tells you what to think about, and then you go out and search for it. Oh, I'll check that, I'll check that, I'll check that. Because sometimes when you're trying to figure something out, what I find is that I don't trust ChatGPT for the, the right answers, but I do trust it to point me in the right direction um, and get me thinking about the, the concepts that I need to then search about. 
and to figure that out. We're going to be talking about video over IP um, probably at least once a quarter. So definitely keep your eye out for the for the second hours that we do there because it's really going to be an important thing as we're going to start ramping up with both NDI um, and then SRT, uh, all the other transports, 2110. These are all things that we're going to spend more and more time on as we can go forward. And just pulling in um, from the chat, Mickey mentions that instead of referencing books, I would take a certification tour course or retake updated courses on the technolo technology. Next question. Franjan Banwell in San Diego, California. Is it a simple thing or are there hoops to jump through when a band or individual posts a cover of other artists' music? Go ahead, Mitchell. It's far simpler to do it before uh, you publish your uh, cover of the song and uh, a lot harder if you don't. For example, uh, there's two licenses for every uh, song that's out there. There's a mechanical and there's publishing rights. Generally, this, this would be coming under publishing. Uh, but there's a famous story uh, that I just saw in the news the other day. Uh, Sting was talking about uh, Puff Daddy's uh, cover of I'll Be Missing You and the fact that he didn't get permission in advance. There was a nasty... Uh, lawsuit that ensued and they eventually became friends because puff decided to pay sting five thousand dollars a day for life for as long as sting is alive so sting said it was great i put my kids through college alex <laughs> it's such a good story too there's a long there's a long thing about that and sting is totally totally cool with that um yeah the if you're going to do it for com commercially and i believe actually that the only thing you need to get it and I may, I, I may be wrong, but I, I think it's just mechanical rights that you need. The publishing rights are related to the song itself, I, I think. Um, and because uh, in the past, we've seen mechanical rights be the thing that we had to cover um, anyway. But the, uh, the, uh, if you're doing it for YouTube and you don't care about monetization, then you can pretty much do whatever you want. <laughs> like just, you know, if you, uh, if, because they'll, you know, and you, what you do is you take the song and you put it up there and you see YouTube will tell you whether you're, you're going to get a strike or not. If you're not going to get a strike and you don't care about monetization, then you, um, then you can throw it up there. And here's what people do with that. They have other videos that they do that are originals that are all kinds of other things on their channel and they're very careful to make sure that those are monetized but they might put things up there that are going to get a lot of views and potentially a lot more subscribers that they're going to lose monetization on and so you can you can kind of go back and forth of those covers but the mechanical rights on youtube are not particularly expensive they're just a little bit of a process to to get those or, or to get those rights yeah go ahead bill well, I've found this always to be more complex than I thought because there are so many kinds of rights. We've talked a lot about the mechanical rights are one thing, synchronization rights to put a piece of music with other AV kinds of sources and another thing. There's another category called compulsory rights, which are kind of interesting. And these are people who have said, I want to put my music, maybe classic songs or something like that, out there in a form that anybody can use them, but the royalty system takes money from whatever monetization you do and sends it back to the original artist. So you can see that with all these categories of different rights, this is a tough thing to navigate. I know in the modern era, it's still a bit of a mess. Just be as careful as you can before you decide that you're going to use that pop hit with something you do and distribute it widely. Chances are somebody is going to raise their hand and go, no, nah, I want the money from that, not you. Next question. Uh, Mitch Hill, Wilmington, Delaware. If Zoom reports your video is 720 and you know your camera is making 1080, how do you bump Zoom up to the proper resolution? Go ahead, Alexander. Yeah, this is something that gets brought up every now and again. So Zoom seems to have a thing with uh, the, the number of cores, I think it is, that your processor has. So you want something with at least a quad core processor. I actually got out, got caught out a couple of weeks ago with an issue where it was sending 720 and I didn't understand what was going on and until I noticed that the Backblaze backup utility was uh, was just sending some files up to the cloud and it was taking almost 20 megabits per second of my 100 megabits. I had 80 megs left, but for some reason, even just that, it, Zoom is super sensitive to what's going on in the network. The moment I turned that off, I got 10 NDP. So just make sure you've got Dropbox and whatever other backup utilities, just turn all that stuff off. Talak? So there's a couple of things that Zoom does in order to keep the experience of, of the majority of users, the majority of, of, of meeting attendees to not have issues. And that is like what Alexander was talking about is to keep 
utilization, you know, have utilization limits that drop down the resolution in order to help um, sort of with the pipeline of that. Of that, the other thing that happens is <clears throat> if there's anybody in the meeting that is only able to receive 720 in the HD side of things, then it'll drop the entire meeting down to 720 because um, it, it, it's trying to it's trying to keep that flow of information in in uh, as clean of shape as it possibly can. It doesn't have the intention of always giving you 1080. It has the intention of always having a really good meeting. So um, uh, you got to think of it a little bit differently than maybe uh, you would in a broad broadcast space. So if you're looking at what's going on in the meeting, if there's someone with an, with an iPad that has you pinned that can only receive 720, you may end up, you know, or somebody else pinned, you may end up changing the uh, the, the resolution. What you can do to, to ask people to help you with that is if they do have an iPad, have them go to gallery, gallery view, um, because that drops down to the, to the SD side of things and then is no longer going to be, um, connecting to, or pulling down that HD pathway. So I'm going to chime in here because I've been coming in at 720 on and we were trying to figure it out from like the PC. It was it the PC side. So just to, I'm going to have to go back and watch this episode specifically for this question. So just making sure there isn't anything else in the background. I just want to make sure that I'm clear on on the troubleshooting. Yeah, look to see if you've got anything happening in terms of download, um, if, if there's any kind of automatic cloud backup going on and then make sure that there's no other um, uh, large processing type of uh, software that's doing a bunch of work in the background. Copy that. Thank you. See, office hours where all these great questions come. You never know when it's the right question for you. <laughs> Next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina asks, looking for one or two channels of wireless mic in the $300 US range. Looking at DJI, what else should I be looking at? Alex? I think DJI is the right one right now. Like I, I just think that it's, uh, of all the things that we've seen out there as far as range and stability, um, I have a bunch of, I haven't bought it yet, but I have a lot of people that I know that have been really happy with the form factor as well as the stability. Um, I think that as long as you're not trying to make it do too much, you should be okay. Santa Monica, of course, makes another set of these as well as the, obviously, the road goes. But the road goes have been one of those things that they work great at about, um, they work sometimes at like 30 or 40 feet. Uh, they work great at about five feet, <laughs> 10 feet. Uh, and then as as it goes between 10 and 30, it's kind of a, you know, uh, random, <laughs> random, effect, you know, where you put them starts to matter, so on and so forth. But I haven't tested the DG, DGI, but we know that a lot of people here in our group have used them and are really happy with them. Alexander? Yeah, exactly. The DGI stuff and the Road Go wireless stuff, I mean, they're 2.4 gigahertz, so you have to be careful about where you're going to be using them. And they certainly can work and they sound fine. Another option, too, is Samson. The Samson Constant Wireless Series, they make a really inexpensive body pack transmitter or receiver system uh, that does use the uh, analog UHF band as well. So that's another option. I, I can see on Sweetwater here, if you're in the US, you can get a dual channel system with two headsets for $419. So a little more than 300 what you were thinking of. But I mean, for two body pack transmitters and two headsets, that's pretty good. Next question. Eric Price in Kansas City, U.S. says, up next, Alex, checking back in to see if you, you've experimented yet with using the Korg Nano Control 2 to control your mix pre and what you think. I had great success using the Novation Launch Control to record two podcasts, but boy, it's big. Actually, if we can go to Alex first and then we'll come to you, Matt. All I was going to say is that I, I, it's still sitting here and I have not had time to sit down and, and, and open up that can of worms. <laughs> like it's, it's like a, I know that there's like a bunch of hours on the other side of me plugging it in. So I have it here and I'll probably have to find a time that Chris and I can. I, I have to admit that I'm kind of lazy in the sense that I don't really want to try to figure something out myself if I know somebody else in our group has it. So uh, you'll probably see us pop in. I'll mention it in Discord. But Chris... You know, I'll get wait until Chris Fenwick and I are both at the same in after hours at the same time, and then I'll just let you all know, and then we'll go through it from scratch uh, because that's how I like to learn is just ask somebody who knows how to do it. Go ahead, Matt. Well, I hadn't realized this was a uh, follow up to Alex. 
the would you be controlling the mix pre directly or are you looking to control the recording software and using the mix pre as an audio interface so i'm going to try it with mix pre uh i it's not why i bought it i bought it not to control the mix pre but but really to um uh control um the um uh la loud labs um i can't think of the name of it right now uh um but but the uh you can hear my my clickety clack um keyboard as I try to remember what it was, Soundesk. So Soundesk is the software that Chris has been playing with and then I started playing with and then Chris started playing with and then Chris went way further than I did. So now I get to catch up and by, this is also why we, we, we share what we're doing with everybody is so that I got into it. Like I started playing with Soundesk and then Chris became an expert at Soundesk and now I just get to feed off of Chris's knowledge. <laughs> so, so anyway, so uh, I'm gonna jump in and, and, but I got it to control that, but I am gonna try to play with having it control um, you know, control my mix pre, and I also have a, I have a, um, uh, I have a Scorpio that I was going to try to connect it to as well. So I, I was going to play with both of those to, to see what what's possible. Yeah, the one thing with the nano controls is they're USB. They're not a, an actual, so they they show up as a MIDI device in the computer. But if you were connecting to something that was expecting a MIDI interface, um, you would want to. Go into the computer and then use something like MIDI pipe on right. a Mac to uh, reroute right. the reroute the signal that. or MIDI yoke on a PC. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. Next question. Next one comes from Alex Lindsay in Nevada, California, and Alex uh, is asking for a quick update on the cooking. Or tells I'm us he has a quick update. Say, yeah, yeah how's it go for it, Alex. Update. I figured we would just give you guys updates and we'll, every once in a while to see to tell you um, uh, where we're at at it. So the idea is uh, Hosmuk sent over a, 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 um, a Mac, Mac Mini Pro and we're, so we're trying to figure this out. And so I've got these, I got uh, either, I'm going to use either three or four of these little, these little guys. And the goal here is to build a rig that, um, that we could first do the cooking with, but also theoretically you could send a rig out that someone could do a, a show us something like, hey, I want you to show me a piece of hardware like a switcher or something. And I'm just gonna send you a rig and it's gonna be really easy. For, so this is like the beginning of this. And so I figured I'd just give you everyone, everyone, every week or two, just like, here's where we're at. Because our goal eventually is to build a rig that is, if you think about it like this, there's a screen here, there, it's probably a little thick like this. And it has basically a, um, you know, a, 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 it pops open like this, you know, and, and goes down and then we're going to vacuum form a, a camera behind here. So one of the, one of those cameras is going to go into a, imagine a teleprompter without anything behind it, just the little bump where that, where that's going to be. And then, um, and then what we want to do is put some ports on the side and then we can run other cameras and mics and so on and so forth out the side. You have a little Mac mini in here, um, and then you have a screen. And so that's kind of where we're trying to get to. Um, so that you can send something out that's really easy to just kind of open up and, and get working. And we've built other versions look like that. But I, what, I, what I can tell you is I've gone through a lot of cables so far, and I've realized that the only way to get the cameras to work is you think that the 480 megabits per second is enough, and it's not. The cameras just stop working. You need to get the 3.2, um, you know, Gen or, you know, Gen 2 or whatever, the the really high, the 10 gig USB cables um, to, to, to get these to stay on. They come on for about a minute. And they, or not even a minute, 30 seconds, and then they, they close. <laughs> so so anyway, that's our update right now. Uh, we're going to do the trials and tribulations of us kind of working through this. Um, and, and the shorter cables all work fine. You know, it's these longer cables that uh, appear to need these these higher ones. And these are this is a 15-foot cable. I'm going, I'm retreating to 10-foot um, cables uh, because I can't quite get the, can't, can't quite get the 15-foot ones to work. Go ahead, Kyle. So I'm I'm very curious and I want to know more and I want to talk more about this. But the uh, first question is, uh, you have multiple cameras. Are they all going into the same computer? Or are you trying to, have you looked at switching and, they're, and doing? They're all going in the same computer and they're all going to go, we're going to make a zoom. We're going to have it, the, it's going to be four cameras and we're making a zoom room on the, on the um, Mac mini. So the Mac Mini will actually send all four feeds back to, a, you uh, know, that we can grab with Zoom ISO and just pull them out. So the idea is yeah. that, that the system, the person doesn't have to know anything about, we don't, the goal is that the person doesn't have to do anything. Like open this up, paint by numbers, put these lights up, 
put this over top and we can we can control those cameras so that's part of the thing is that if i want to reframe or do something else i can just sit there and just move all the cameras around and make them all work so we get to re you know if they put the cameras in the right place and i'm trying to think about the rig that they're going to put up like i'm you know like i have um this little there's this matthews makes these um mini grip uh, micro grip, I think is what it's called. And it's like real thin little, little cables. And so the idea is to have this like thin little thing that you can put up and put the, put the cameras on and it'll all, you know, hang some of them upside down and et cetera to, to make that all work. And so, um, you know, I'm just at the very beginning of figuring this rig out, but I think it's, it's a rig that the idea is you could send it in a, something that maybe is a little bit bigger than a 1510 case. And I just send it to somebody and they, if they want to show something that, or do cooking, they can just open it up and, boom, they're in, you know, and, and they're able to, 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 um, and we're able to control everything and we get all the feeds. They don't have to switch anything we can cut. And that, what's really cool about that is if you think about that, when we think about the automation, we could say, you know, you could have something on your stream deck that shows, show everybody's stove, show everybody's cutting board, show everybody, you know, straight up, you know, so you could have things that are grabbing all those feeds and doing all those things with all those feeds, rather than trying to remote control something on their end, we're, and now we, we we will do that because of course that Mac Mini will VPN back, so we'll we'll already have that that information coming back to us, so we can control a lot of the basic stuff from the Mac Mini. But the main thing is is that we're just getting raw feeds that we can cut. Kyle or Alex, that he Alex. answered my question. Oh, sorry, yeah. Alexander. Yeah, Alex, I don't know if you've come across these, but uh, Cable Matters makes a really nice active USB-C cable. That's three point USB 3.2 Gen 2 compatible. So if you haven't tried those, you might. They're not. They're pretty reasonable, and I've had good luck with that, Brian. See, and this is why I wanted to do an update, as I was like, people will come up with better ideas. So, um, so we'll keep on giving you updates as we as we get this a little closer. The the lab version of this should be running in about two weekends. So I'm gonna hopefully do something not this weekend because I'm gonna be somewhere. But next weekend, the following weekend, I'm going to try to we're going to try to do something with it where the the rig is running. Probably not with the vacuum form yet, but maybe we'll see. I'm going to go sit, go over to the ILM model shop, <laughs> see, see if we can't build something. So we'll see. Next question, Douglas Carmichael. Up next, Panasonic's Avionics are bringing spatial audio to in-flight entertainment with their Astrova. IFE platform, considering the high noise environment of an aircraft cabin, would there be any benefit to spatial audio? Go ahead, Talak. So uh, a couple of things I want to point out about this. <clears throat> um, first of all, I think it's a gamble for Panasonic to do this because why would uh, a airline add a bunch of weight to, to, their, to their platform, use a whole bunch more fuel, when people are already bringing their devices on, onto, onto planes and already using those to watch um, any kind of entertainment. And those devices already have uh, spatial audio. <laughs> so what's the point? Um, second of all, uh, I think, you know, spatial audio, when you have full wraparound earphones uh, that have that, have that kind of uh, um, feature, you can drown out and 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 block out enough of the aircraft noise to actually have that be an experience if that's the experience that you want. Um, and so I think, and I looked I looked into this particular piece of equip, equipment that Panasonic is looking to to roll out. I think the big deal here is that they are are trying to connect with p people's own devices with their own type of gear, their own headphones, their own iPhones, their own iPads. And essentially making it, uh, trying to bring in-flight entertainment into the, t the 21st century, which um, it hasn't been for a while. Alex? I think obviously they're trying to protect their market because the market is just cratering. You know, it, you know, there's so many flights now that we get on that don't have any screens at all. Uh, and because, of course, as, as Tlaloc pointed out, the weight is an issue. And then also they're just looking at usage rates. There's just not that many people using them. The best use for most of those screens is as a suction cup to hold your iPad, you know. And so so I think that a lot of people, you know, I think that that's really the challenge is that no one's really using the screens at much at all. And it's most of the interfaces. The problem is, is you're competing with Google and Apple who have, who are spending a lot more money on the interface. One, the All of the regulatory requirements and all the things and just not very good designs 
most of the interfaces that that are created by the airlines are just a mess. Like they're just so painful to use. And and so the problem is is that I have an iPad all the time. And I'm like, well, that, I'm just going to use the thing that works, you know. And so that's the, it's a, it is a big challenge. I can see why they're doing it. They're taking the risks because they're they, they had a market. It was making billions of dollars or million, at least hundreds of millions, and now it's not. <laughs> so they're trying to like they got to make some swipe at it. But I I don't I agree with Twalock. I'm not sure if it'll work. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, plus one on that. Um, in another life, I was doing in-flight entertainment with music. And there was a little bit of hardware involved. Getting anything that attaches to the uh, power grid in an aircraft or any type of electrical device is incredibly complicated to get it past the FAA. So I can't imagine anything that would be a moving target, even software-wise, uh, being a very good uh, gamble on the part of Panasonic because they can't just make changes to the electronics without getting it approved. It takes years to do that. Next question. Next one comes to us from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles. And Gordon says, are there any advantages to buying a separate phone for video work over using the one in your pocket? Go ahead, Matt. You get a number of advantages. One is if you keep it stripped down to just the video apps, it gives you a lot more storage for recording content. And then if it's not your daily driver, you don't have to worry about calls coming in and interrupting your video record. And Richard? Yeah, you have two phones. Now you can do twice the amount of work. <laughs> Alex? Yeah, the, uh, sorry, that was, that was fun. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've had multiple phones a lot and I use them for a lot of things. Like I've done stereo tests where we actually built a rig, printed a rig that you could put two of the iPhones and they would, you would, it would set the lenses at, at interocular distance from each other but one phone was upside down, so it would flip over and you could shoot stereo video you know, on them. So that's that's one good use for them. But the biggest thing is, is that you don't get phone calls. You can hand it to somebody else and let them go run with it. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of advantages to having those. But mine have now been distributed mostly to my family, which then I just take back when needed. <laughs> so. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I run two phones all the time. One is, quote, my business phone, and one's my personal phone. And the business phone, I, when I go out with the monopod to shoot events and things like that, it's pretty trivial to mount one phone at the end of the monopod for high angle or low angle shots. And I have the other phone on a little bracket at the bottom of the monopod, which means I can use it as a monitor for the phone that's up above the crowd that I actually can't see. It's a, it, I, I find it really useful. And usually I turn in my old phone, but I've just come to the point of turning in the third one back now because I rev them pretty often. Talak? Yeah, I was just going to point out that we all like to upgrade our phones. So if you can keep a, a previous one, you can put it to work. And the best example that we have of that is conversation with Tony Mobley, where um, uh, there was, I think his son had an had a iPhone X um, and it wasn't charging. And I pointed out, take a take a little toothpick or a dental pick and carefully, carefully pull the lint out of the charging port and the thing's charged right up. Um, and uh, so he's now, has removed the phone service from that um, and removed most of the apps and uses it primarily as his camera to do a, a YouTube show. So absolutely do that because you can, you can utilize that second phone and don't use it as a phone because that'll actually... Um, interfere with the work you're trying to do with this with the camera because it's a camera first and a phone second i mean let's be honest right and following up likewise with richard it's like you can do double the work one i would call it like my creator phone last year i upgraded i think it was to the 13 and i had all intentions of like getting rid of that phone and then i was like well it was, took too much to get all the apps over and just by default it became the recording and for social, like if you've got an account and you, you're in the midst of putting the copy together, you can just go to the other phone and, and it pretty much mirrors. So I can access various accounts without coming out, losing work. And it's like, how was I doing it without having two phones? So yes, the workflow and functionalities just increases your, your productivity. Bill? 
Yeah, I'm just saying it's real also easy to deduct one of your phones if you have a dedicated phone for business purposes. I mean, they're not going to argue if they say, you, why are you taking this off your taxes? You just go, well, that's my business phone. I have another phone over here. It's my personal phone. You really want to challenge this? And they generally won't. And Alexander? Tangentially related, yes, I agree. Do not uh, do not get rid of your phones. And uh, nowadays, Roland actually has a really cool product called the Aerocaster. And you can actually utilize those older iPads and iPhone devices and you can have up to four cameras and it will also live stream and you can cut a show and do it all with iOS devices. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, the 14-inch MacBook Pro reports a resolution of 3024 by 1964 to Mac OS. Would ETC EOS be usable on it, even though the actual screen size is smaller? ETC quotes a minimum required resolution of 1920 by 1080. Pollock? Uh, this is only limited by your eyes or the the magnifying magnifier glasses that you buy at Sam's Club. Um, you, the 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 bigger the resolution, the more you can actually fit inside of your your e ETC panel. For those that don't know what ETC is, ETC EOS is a light board software. And with lighting board softwares, you have <clears throat> multiple pages that you need to work on kind of simultaneously. So a lot of times people have multiple monitors and then sometimes they split their single monitor or their, even their multiple multiple monitors into two or three or four different um, panes to look at. So if you have good, good eyes that can look at smaller text, you, you're in good shape to have that extra resolution. If you have smaller resolution and you connect that up, what ends up happening is you squeeze every one of those panes down so much that they become really hard to use. And before we get to our second hour, you have the opportunity to go ahead and vote on the remaining questions and also go ahead and get your questions ready for our business of theater conversation. Next question. Next one comes to us from Alexander Knight in Vancouver, BC here on the panel. Alex Lindsay, have you replaced the stock Linsole two pin cable with a third party one? The wire looks thinner than the chunky stock one supplied. Go ahead, Alex. This is actually the stock one. I had a thicker one that I was using because it just was, it felt, it felt very luxurious. There was something about it that I really liked. It was like $10 or something. It just was, it, it, it was bent a little bit nicer and it, and it had a little cinch up and I, I thought it would be nice. The problem was, is that um, over uh, one of the ears, it didn't stay in. <laughs> so it would just keep on popping. Every once in a while, you'd see me sitting there trying to put it back in. And I was like, oh, I got to stop. So um, yeah, so I haven't, uh, so I stopped using it. So I'm now just using the ones that came with it and they're they're working fine. Next question. Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona says, tips and tricks to keeping gear dry when live streaming in the rain. I'm covering the Overland West Expo, the uh, Overland Expo West this weekend, but rain is in the forecast. Alex? I mean, the big thing is tents. <laughs> like, you know, find, you know, that you want to try to find a tent. Uh, it, it, a tent is one place to do it. A lot of times we require, I mean, like when I'm doing it for a third party if, and it's not for myself, uh, we require something that's hard. You know, like I want to be in some, inside of something, but um, but you can get what's called, I guess, a pop-up canopy. Uh, and a pop-up canopy is going to be uh, usually 10 by 10, 15 by 15. And then you're going to put your tables inside of that. And, um, and the one thing to think about there is it may seem like an extra thing, but it's really worth putting something, you wanna get there hopefully before it's already started to rain. I mean, that's the big uh, thing that you wanna to try to do. And then if you can buy, go to a remnant um, carpet location, and oftentimes you can buy a 10 by 10 foot square of, of carpet that is a, is a remnant and you throw it down there, man, does it make a difference? Like you're not on dirt and dirt isn't f popping up all the time and everything else. And then you just, you can do whatever you want with it afterwards. <laughs> Try to clean it up or throw it away or whatever. But but the, it's great to have, um, you know, something that's, when you walk in, you feel like you're in a little cocoon, you know, <laughs> that, that makes all of that work. But um, the other thing to do is if you're, if you're not using it overnight or something like that, now once you're in a tent, you have to worry about that. Um, but uh, throw plastic over top of everything. You know, just wrap everything with plastic to make sure that it's not going to get rain, even if the canopy goes somewhere. Um, and then finally, the other thing that we use a lot of are win Winnebago's. Winnebago's are, are really good. You can pull them up and you can start running cables out of the windows. Um, and uh, they are much more luxurious. Uh, you can get ones with uh, toy haulers in the back. And those are great. Um, but, uh, but it depends on your budget. But we found that, and there's companies that um, I can't think of the name of the company right now, but there are companies that specialize in making Winnebago's that are 
Winnebago's that are um, designed for production. They literally build them for production. And so we, we, um, we've used them for a variety of shows. And then Jack just added in the chat that he'll be going between tents to interview the vendors, just as a, some additional context. Yeah. So all I'd say there is that you, you want to have a, there, there are lots of things for cameras that will go around them. The worst case is a trash bag, um, you know, that we put over our cameras to, to hold those things in and then uh, just get a transmitter where your central area is going to be and try to keep it as light as possible. Bill? Since I shot most of my career in Arizona, um, not so much rain, but sun, but sun and rain on rainy days. So my strategy, I had a lot of easy up pop up tents, as Alex is describing, we used to use those all the time in the field to provide both shade and protection from rain and the elements. The other thing I did was I had a ton of golf umbrellas. And if you get a Mafer clamp, there are rigs that you can uh, clamp in your umbrella to that. And I can't tell you the number of times that uh, I would set up a camera outdoor and go, it's just too hot for the camera. So I would use one of those black golf umbrellas right over the top of the camera just to shield it from the sun. And that would go as we move them from location to location. I never wanted sun hitting my cameras directly. It was just too intense in Arizona. So there's a lot of ways to protect them. And Talak. So and I did some ENG work back when I was doing an internship at a news gathering agency in Germany. We used the porta brace covers on on the on the large cameras that, and I don't know if they still build those for even for the, some of the smaller ones. Uh, probably not. But the idea was to keep uh, keep water off of your camera because um, you had to be out in the rain. You had to be getting getting these stories. Um, so if you're doing live streaming, you're probably going to have other gear as well. So the idea I think would be to look at each individual piece of equipment get it uh, covered against the elements, and then don't worry about your cables because they're going to be fine. All right. Well, we are ready for our second hour, getting into it a little bit early because we have a jam-packed panel to discuss the business of theater. And just producers, again, this is a great opportunity for you to go ahead and submit your questions for them. And we're going to dive right into this because just when we had our pre-production, I think it was last week, Friday, and just talking through all the different facets and verticals in for theater and that you've got the, the front of house team, you've got those that are, there's just so many acronyms. So I'm going to let everyone go ahead and introduce themselves. And Talak, let's start with you. And just if you could, each of you give us like a 30 second of who you are and what space you're in, because that that's what I find that there's just so much value in learning all of the different areas. Um, uh, I'm Tlaloc Lopez Waterman. I'm a lighting designer, projection designer, sometimes scenic designer. I'm in the design space within theater and opera, um, sometimes concerts. And uh, those all have different differences to them, those different different spaces within theatrical performance. But um, uh, I travel around and get contracted by individual companies to, to um, build a design for a particular show. Kyle? Hi, my name's Kyle. Uh, <laughs> born in Oklahoma, uh, raised in Arkansas, spent a year at Actors Theater of Louisville. Um, been in Chicago since uh, 1998, and I started as an actor. Uh, then became a designer, a uh, director, a uh, producer, and most recently a board member. Uh, but all of that is in uh, non-equity Chicago theater, storefront theater, which is a, uh, as we discussed, an entirely different animal uh, beast all to itself. So that's me. All right, Ali. Hi, I'm Ali Amade. Uh, I am, oh, I wear many hats. I am originally from Chicago. I'm a professor of theater at UW-Madison. Before that, I was at UNC Charlotte. I'm a costume designer by trade. I'm also a playwright. I'm in the uh, United Scenic Artists Local 829 Union for designers. And I work mostly in storefront theater in Chicago, but also in regional equity theaters as well. Awesome. And then Matt? Hi, I'm Matt Parker. I'm the resident sound designer and head of audio and video at the Oslo Repertory Theater in Sarasota, Florida. I've been here for 30 years. I was trained at uh, Ohio University, where I got my BFA degree in theater and 
before coming to the Oslo. I've done cruise ship installs, uh, S- summer stock theater, and um, and one outdoor drama right before coming to the Oslo. And uh, been picking up a little bit of uh, YouTube streaming work during during COVID. Awesome, and we will wrap with Richard. Yes, I'm uh, Richard Lavery from uh, uh, Belfast. I'm the artistic director of a building, uh, Accidental Theatre, based in Belfast. Um, I've got a Master of Fine Arts uh, uh, in Theatre Directing from London University. Um, uh, all the other kind of things. And so let's we're going to go right into it now. The industry, in pr- from a production perspective, digital. There's been just so much change over the past number of years. How are people surviving in the theater space? And let's start with. And I I should go through hands. Kyle, you want to start there? Uh, we have a thing called uh, Sir Thrival uh, that we do at our theater company because we often find ourselves uh in moments of uh crunch time uh we also call it a crisis opportunity um whenever we run into problems uh we try and tackle it with as much uh extreme gusto as possible um so uh covid definitely uh gave us the biggest crisis opportunity <laughs> that we've experienced in 30 years um, but the the way we pivoted uh, was uh, digital programming and uh, doing things online uh, because there was no live theater uh, happening. So that that's kind of where we started uh, just to sort of rebuild and reimagine how we are doing theater. Halak? So... Um... Because I was a projection designer and I uh, did a lot of work with Isadora, I, not too long into the into the pandemic, was asked to start thinking about how to make make theater events happen uh, with the help of Zoom and with the help of streaming and, and and so on. So that shifted a lot. But you know, as as the pandemic has has gone into its next evolution that we're in now, um, what we realized is that about thirty to 40% of the technical workforce is just gone. I mean, they they realized how hard they were working to every day with the kind of income that they were that they were getting and it wasn't sort of matching um, their world and so they they left and did started to do other things. And so there's a real need for technical um, expertise in in the in the world in the world of theater at multiple levels at some of the smaller community levels at the union levels you know ev- everyone is looking for technical know-how and technical knowledge and it, it it really has affected the industry in a big way and i think it's probably um a a m- more more silent crisis than uh even the pandemic was so would you say that then because of the the need for the technical knowledge that there are opportunities for those with that information, those skill sets to then pivot into the theater spaces? I, I think so. I think there's a real opportunity there now. I mean, I, I know many people uh, who have been at the beginning of their career and have jumped up a few rungs in an immediate sort of way because they did not they decided they wanted to to keep keep with it and and then they ended up on Broadway or they ended up on you know um, uh, in places that that were in their in their top five kind of places to be it's not for it doesn't happen for everybody but I think with every raising of hierarchies in in any system opportunity persists Richard yeah just on on uh, Talalak's point uh, the UK government during the pandemic ran a quite infamous ad um that uh, Fatima's next job could be in cyber um as a way of encouraging artists out of the artistic field and into other fields that they could get paid more in um uh, that's one of the uh, things that the, when the arts was in crisis and everyone was closed down uh, the UK government's response was to 
get a different job. Uh, so there is a, a fair amount of brain drain, uh, definitely. Uh, uh, we, we've already seen that because we're from quite a small region in the UK, um, that most, if you want a sustainable career, you move out of uh, the local area or you, 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 you move out for a while, then move back, which is something that, that I did. Um, so retaining talent has is, is always been a bit of a challenge uh, in, in the arts because of that kind of pay skill differential. And there's even a pay skill differential between the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland because of the, the difference between UK and EU. Um, what's interesting that seems to be coming out of the pandemic is uh, a spectrum uh, when it comes to building based theatres where um, those theatres who have not changed their model whatsoever to the ones that have changed their model completely and then most organisations will be on that spectrum in, in some way or, or, or other um, uh, certainly for us we we rely upon the main business model of what we used to do as, as an organisation the in person uh, and then the digital side the new kind of engaging audience side um, has become something smaller that will we we believe and I think uh, we were already seeing this uh, that it will grow to being the bigger part of our business uh, over the next kind of five years um, it's it's an interesting thing that we introduced live streaming way back when it pre-pandemic as mostly a marketing tool and then during the pandemic it obviously became the, the number one part of our business uh, and then after the pandemic we kept it on at, at, a, at a great cost with the aim of around about 10% of our tickets being digital uh, in that first year we ran it. And you know, this is the, the year last year to, to the uh, end of the financial year, a couple of months back. Uh, when I came to do the, 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 the study of it, the, the, the analysis, we found that 24% of our sales were actually online, uh, not our target of 10%. We, we exceeded it by over twice. So there's a huge opportunity with the accessibility uh, that the, the digital kind of aspects uh, give us that uh, we've gone you know 100% down to try and make sure it's a huge part of what we do. Um, and like Fatima, our, our job has gone digital, strangely enough. And Matt? Our pivot when COVID happened was we converted the front steps of the theater into a stage and performed uh, outdoor concerts. We did a you know, Christmas uh, piece, a concert stage version of Camelot. And the reason we did the concert pieces is because of COVID, you were able to keep people spaced separately and like av avoid most of the contact issues and uh, keep COVID protocols. And uh, then there was also government support that uh, helped and we were running with you know, reduced uh, staff for, um, for the outdoor staging. And we literally had t-shirts made up that said pivot. Nice. Uh, and Ali? Yeah, well, as an educator, what's what we've been seeing is that during the pandemic, obviously, there was a huge loss of hands-on practical learning. So, like, the students that we're seeing in the tech theater um, program, for example, lost two years of working on shows in high school and possibly years of working on it in university. So there's we have huge gaps in knowledge that we're trying to fill in a much more condensed amount of time, which has been a challenge for sure. Um, this is also uh, in conversely, they also got a whole bunch of experience in digital stuff that they weren't expecting. So we have a lot of actors who now have lots of experience doing self-taping and on-camera work and working with microphones who normally would not have had any of that experience in a traditional theater educational setting, right? So um, there have been some benefits and also lots of um, losses, and hopefully it'll start to regulate right now. But we're also seeing we had a reduction in people entering into theater programs in the last couple of years, and that is just now starting to go back with um, enrollment levels, too. So hopefully those new trained individuals will start coming into the business now. And since we're on this this topic of even the talent and and just where that that brain trust is going, how what are some of the ways that people can make money in this space? Whether um, I think that there's 
we might have discussed this with contractors or working in-house or if, if someone wants to to go into that part, because just knowing our office hours community, if this is something that people are would like to explore, what kind of options and opportunities um, or Kyle, was it Thrive Opportunities? Was that what, <laughs> what you had said before, Talak? Yeah, so I think there are multiple ways to get involved here. So <clears throat> one, uh, as we were saying before, there's these different levels. There's community theaters, there's um, uh, local theaters, there's equity theaters, there's Lord, uh, League of, of Regional Theater um, uh, theaters, there's operas. And so each one of these groups in a, in a, in a locality will have uh, a company or venues that they work in. And depending on how the venue is put together, either the venue has um, <clears throat> technicians that they hire in through, uh, you know, a list that they've, that they've utilized or through a union, through IATSE, um, or, and also, and sometimes a company itself who's coming into that venue will bring their own labor designers and contractors. A lot of, one, one of the things that um, you're going to have to think about if you start to to, to go into this kind of work is that a lot of times if you're working for a company on an hourly basis as a technician, you can work as an employee, which is a really good thing because um, you're doing physical labor. You're up uh, uh, um, many, many feet in the air. You're, you're dealing with heavy things. You're, you know, so, and you can fall into orchestra pits. So you want to have the protection of workers comp. You want to have the protection uh, of, um, uh, of being an employee for liability reasons, as a person who's a contractor and a, and a designer, I have to I have to assume those responsibilities. So when I'm walking in a space, it's very tempting. I'm a I'm a physical technical guy to go in and help and work on something, but I have to think very very carefully about that because I don't have the protection that I might um, have as a, as an employee. Great points there, Richard. Um, thankfully, because of the way just the, that I look laid out the different levels of theater, um, theaters tend to be, and this is the buildings, not just production companies, but they tend to be, um, community hubs rather than necessarily a theater. Um, they tend to be arts venues uh, in, the, in the UK rather than dedicated to just one art form. And there's definitely ones that are dedicated to opera and ones that are dedicated to theater, but there's also ones like ours that are multi-format that, you know, that will have music events, comedy events, uh, and, and theatrical events. Um, it means that there's a large amount of opportunity there um, to get involved, both at the engagement, the community level of getting just participating in workshops and uh, uh, getting involved in uh, front of house duties and little things like that, um, versus also just getting really stuck in and getting experience behind the technical side. What's really interesting is because of the digital aspects that uh, that have started to introduce, um, it means that you can get involved from a much greater distance now. Uh, the idea of uh, of training on, um, as an example of what we've been doing, that's been mentioned here many times, the Belfast method, where we have people control cameras from the other side of the world, is a th is an aspect where you can get involved in the actual daily working of, of the theatre that would never have exist existed before the pandemic or maybe existed in, in five or seven years time. So there's a huge opportunity to get involved both in technical level and also just in, in supporting and helping out a, a theatre. You know, there, there's, uh, and, and then there's obviously the performance side as well, because most theatres will usually have some type of developmental track to, to get people involved from an early age and also from older ages. Um, I know in Battersea Arts Centre in London, as well as ourselves and, uh, and lots of theatres across the UK run scratch programmes where you can get involved just to test work out, to write something new uh, and then get onto stage if you want as well. And Northern Ireland in particular has a very large amateur dramatic scene as well, which means that there's, you know, every level of uh, industry, um, the, uh, uh, you know, as Talalik mentioned, because there's a thirst for, for talent, there's always going to be opportunity to get involved. And Ali. Well, I'm always t telling my students to diversify a little bit. Um, I think uh, for a lot of, depending on where you're identifying the market you want to work in, like a location, um, there's a lot of hustling that has to happen, like side hustles. I even have a side hustle as a full-time professor um, as a, on a with an Etsy business. Um, but if you're freelancing, you need to have, as a designer, you often um, have to put together a, a series of gigs um, and then also maybe have a side hustle, like just something I say, do something theater adjacent, you know, like you might get 
paid much better to work as the sound engineer at a mega church than you would be to do theater. Um, but the that side hustle at the mega church will help you fuel your art. You know, like you can keep yourself in rent and ramen by doing um, these theater adjacent jobs, will, which will let you still do your your art. Um, and it's uh, until you, unless you get lucky and get a full-time job somewhere, which is, those are pretty few and far between. So you have to be able to have um, a lot of uh, get up and go <laughs> and hustle. And also I think it's really helpful to have um, writing skills so you can do grants and that sort of thing and business skills so that you can, you know, when you have a thousand jobs, you need to be able to keep track of your taxes and all kinds of expenses so that you don't get uh, slammed when it comes to tax season because you've had a series of gigs that are all um, 1099 miscellaneouses and that you haven't paid taxes on, right? It can be really brutal uh, eye-opening experience to do your taxes for the first time as a freelance artist. Go ahead, Talak. I think uh, your point is well taken about diversity. I, I think in production, in television production and film production, and probably in corporate production, Alex can correct me if, I, if, if, if I'm wrong, but there's, the jobs are a little bit more um, uh, specialized. Um, in, in theatrical world, it's really, really useful to have knowledge about all of it. Because when, when, when you, even as a, as a, if I'm going in as a lighting designer, to have knowledge about how acoustics work in an opera. Um, so I can say in a design meeting, hey, so I'm noticing we have a set that is completely fabric. And is there, is there, is there any concern about actually being able to hear the singers? You know, and so to have that holistic thought process about the whole thing is really important. And then what I found by having that kind of mentality is that when I came into this group, for example, or into other situations, people, people see that as valuable because they understand that, oh, wow, look, you actually think about all of these things and not just, um, you know, doing projection design. And so I think that that is, um, that is something that is in, in incredibly important. It's probably why many theater, uh, uh, technicians and, and artists were able to get other jobs pretty quickly in this time because it's a valuable thing to be able to think that way. Richard? Yeah, just to Ali's point, um, if you if you like writing grant letters uh, and grant uh, uh, proposals, whoa, have we got the jobs for you in this industry? Uh, we 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 will you will be employed till the end of time, uh, at least until ChatGPT takes over. Um, so, uh, which it actually works. I, I've done that as a test. ChatGPT works in grant applications. Um, it's a small secret. Um, the the industry is quite, as, as Telex says, the, the diversification is one of the, the keys and it works for a building as much as it works for an individual. Um, having different uh, projects that you can develop, that you have the energy to develop, whilst also having ways of bringing in passive income uh, from different kind of uh, different places is really important. Um, again, one of the nice things that's come out of the pandemic is the, the reach of digital has become a, not just a platform for, you know, putting ads on on YouTube, it's become an actual monetizable platform. So artists, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in a small region uh, like Northern Ireland, before building a career here was quite difficult. Now you've actually got the options of doing concerts from uh, from afar. Uh, it allows for that sustainability to become much, much more uh, ingrained in your career pathway. So there's, there's huge potential there that's just beginning to, to, to develop. Uh, and reaching beyond your locality um, and starting to think about how to reach uh, the audiences, not just in your country, but in other parts of the uh, parts of the world, um, build your, your tribe as a as the uh, uh, as the uh, the thousand people across the world, uh, your your Patreon, your support, um, thinking about how to develop that is really really important. Go ahead, Alex. And yeah, just following up with what Slalock said, you know, in, I've been in the entertainment industry in some way, shape, or form for over thirty years, and uh, it has been a. a, a all over the place, <laughs> like, you know, constantly learning how to do something else. And what I have found is the thread of many of us that have done well, um, there are some people who can get settled into a space and they just stay there and it, and it works for them. And, and I, I, uh, I, 
I wish I could get to that. <laughs> so, so generally, most of us have been a little bit of, of uh, you know, journeymen who show up in, uh, men and women who show up in uh, different places all over the uh, all over the map. And, and I found that the people who are constantly hungry to keep learning, uh, whether they're settled or whether they're moving, uh, are the ones that are probably the least um, impacted by changes in the industry is because they're constantly learning new things. They're constantly learning new new parts of the system. They understand a greater, a greater um, they have a greater vision of how all of it works as opposed to how their one piece works. So they may be, they may have a spike of knowledge, but they have a lot of knowledge across the board. And a lot of times what I've done in the past is, you know, I may be working on something that I get paid uh, enough to live on, uh, you know, in one place, but I'm volunteering for other things and I'm doing other things and I'm doing experiments over here um, that aren't paying right now, but they're building up my understanding of the whole process. And, and oftentimes, when this one fell out, I just jumped to another rock. <laughs> like, like, you know, this is the end of this one and this is where I go over here. And I've done that probably eight or 10 times in my career. Kyle? In, in that same vein, we, uh, you know, coming up in the non-equity Chicago theater scene, uh, we had a thing of uh, sweat equity, that the way you uh, learned and networked with people and learned about how theater operates and works was uh you've you've showed up and you painted helped paint scenery black and you like as an actor you're you're carrying sound cable or you're plunging toilets sometimes for the theater or you're uh painting the back of flats like you're doing a little bit of everything and that's how you met a director because you were talking about a thing project that they wanted to do while you were both um, sitting there sorting screws. So like, uh, there was a, a lot of just <clears throat> becoming involved was how you uh, got to know people, but also got to know about projects or what, what was happening. This was all pre-social media and all of that fun stuff. So cut to now, there's, there's a, a little less uh, with, you know, not to be like, kids these days but the they there's less involvement to like i'm going to show up and paint something for no money and no uh no guarantee that i'm going to get a role or get a job or whatever and so there's a little like ah there's pushback on the way theater operates as a as a model and so that's a a new thing that we are also dealing with uh on top of everything else so we've touched on, before we get to all of the great questions I see from our producers, we've touched on like how this, this industry works. We've touched on talent to a degree. And if I can ask this question and I get a couple of responses around recruitment, like audience recruitment, because I remember when I was younger, my godmother was saying opera. And so uh, we would always go to whenever her, her church or whenever they, they performed, but that was when I was younger and looking to pass on some of these, the cultural parts of things to, to my daughter, to my, my nieces. And so how, how are, is it, how is recruitment happening? And are there any concerns in that space? Talak? Yeah. So I, I, I look at this a lot. Opera has, has this particular issue in a very acute way because there are, it's, it's a niche it's a niche thing. Not everybody likes opera. Not everybody can get get involved with it. And some people are afraid of it. They think, I can't understand it. It's in a different language. They don't know that there are super titles in English to be, to, be, to read. Um, and so one of the things that I recently witnessed was um, uh, a new uh, vice president of in, a community engagement uh, named Carrie Ann Otaño at, at Opera Delaware she just started walking around in the streets and she's incredibly outgoing and extrovert. And so she would just talk to people and talk to people and talk to people and talk to people. So the opening night of La Traviata had the youngest opera audience and the most diverse opera audience that the company had ever seen in its, I think, 60 year existence. So, you know, it, it is, it's possible. And it's, it's just that, You've got to have the love for what you're doing and you've got to share it. That intentional outreach is what I, I heard you say, essentially. Ali? Yeah, I mean, I think building on what you were just talking about, the 
performing arts in the U.S. anyways have has a bit of an, a huge equity problem in that it's like who can afford to be in theater and who can afford to see it. Um, I mean, I can't I can barely afford the ticket prices, let alone um I mean, just a huge segment of the population is doesn't have that access to it. So um, as an example of how to combat this, the theater company that Kyle and I are in in Chicago, Straw Dog Theater, has moved to a free theater model where tickets are free. Um, we don't charge for tickets and hope that people will donate. Um, it, but in order to provide free and equal access to everyone in the city, um, every, and beyond because we stream many of our performances because um, we think art should be accessible for everybody. And that's helping diversify our audiences, bring new people in. And then um, the people who can afford it are donating money to help pay for their ticket and other people's tickets as well. So uh, that's one way to address those things. Many other theaters are doing to try to recruit new audience members are doing things such as um, doing pay what you can models, doing lotteries, um, doing uh, special uh, subscriber programs for uh, 20 somethings, basically like Steppenwolf was doing that a uh, series of uh, lower price, like $20 tickets for people in their twenties. Um, and to, to try to uh, combat the aging out of many of our audiences. And Matt, so we have a uh, the FSU conservatory attached to our theater, and the third year students before they come into the uh, rep company will do a uh, forty five minute Shakespeare that tours the schools, and so that goes out and most the Sarasota area up up to Tallah uh, up to Tallahassee sometimes Tampa, and so that gives kids who probably would like never you know from their family point of view you know, be taken to the theater gives them an exposure and there's so many people that you know I've run into that I've oh yeah it's like in in school you know saw theater for the first time uh, for the, with the Oslo tour and then uh, group sales uh, in the marketing department will like reach out you know to bring in groups, and I don't know if they still exist, but the Red Hat Ladies, we did uh, Menopause the Musical, you know, brought in Red Hat Ladies, and we extended the show because they were, we were able to keep bringing them into the theater, and, you know, it ran for like three months for what was supposed to be a month-long show. All right. Well, Bill, let's get into these questions. Absolutely. Our first one comes from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. And Tony says, who is responsible for creating a playbill for theater performances and what should be included in it? Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, usually that's the PR marketing department that would uh, put all of that together. And uh, depending on the level and size of your theater, you'd have a whole team that basically puts out a magazine for every production. Um, there are different also levels of uh, billing and who gets billed in what order and uh, sometimes it's contractual depending on uh, who you're working with if the actors have to be listed in a certain way and or in a certain order um, but uh, at our level of non-equity theater it's generally the production manager puts it all together make sure everybody turns in their bios on time and uh, usually there's often the threat if you don't turn it in I'm going to write it for you and it's going to look something like this person does plays, and that's about all you're going to get listed in the program. And Matt? Yeah, to, uh, the uh, managing directors who, who you know, hire the the artists will you know pass on what information they've got as far as you know the artist in you know, the different roles, and then the actors supply their bios and headshots, and then the other design artists. The uh, where you buy the rights for to, uh, for the play, if it's not something that's originally developed for the theater, there'll be you know uh, 
the playwright's name must be like you know this big and in relationship you know this font so you'll have in, in the program you'll have you know the play who wrote it who all the artists are the directors the designers the actors and then lots of ads for uh, the from the co-producers who are you know, help uh, sponsoring the play and uh, local businesses and go ahead talak yeah, so as a designer, I'm always being asked for my bio. It's my least favorite thing in the world to do and my headshot. Um, well, actually, other than in opera, you have to bow at the end of the uh, uh, show, which is the worst. But um, um, but yeah, so designer bios, actor bios, um, donors. So you're going to have a whole section of, of people who have, have helped produce the show financially. Um, you're going to have oftentimes director notes. So if there's, um, if there's some, if there's something special about the concept of the play or, you know, anything like that, there'll, there'll be a little, a little essay about, you know, their way into the particular play or opera or, or piece. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you have advertisements. Um, so one of the ways that corporate sponsors and corporate, um, corporate, uh, donors will, see some sort of return on their investment is to actually buy ad space in the playbill. Um, who, who takes care of making this? It's usually the PR marketing department, but uh, it's the company manager who has to chase me down so that I can update my bio and send it in. <laughs> and Kyle? Uh, we often also have seen uh, recently a push towards uh, digital programs so that w when people get to the theater instead of uh, being especially during the post pandemic people are less likely to want to touch things um that uh they will have a qr code to scan and so they'll go to uh, a digital program in which they will see the actors bios and do all of that there's been some pushback from that because people some while well, some people don't want to touch anything some people are like i like to hold a program and read it before the show so uh but just a another example of Things changing and adapting. Next question. Next one comes to us from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. Theater shows often involve hundreds of or thousands of pounds of human beings on temporary structures. How do safety decisions affect the business of theater or vice versa? Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, similar to what uh, Tlaloc was talking about earlier uh, with Workman's Comp and various, there are uh, things in that nature. IATSE is the uh, union for uh, stagehands, and they generally uh, make sure that all safety precautions are taken care of for stages. Uh, so it's uh, on the theater organization to make sure that everything is safe and secure and ready for people to operate. Tala? So the scenic designer is going to uh, design a show. It's going to have, you know, all kinds of beautiful pictures about it. It's just like the architect in the in, in, in the in the building world. And then there's going to be a technical director, which is like the engineer in the building world. Um, and it, he's going to look at the at the scenic drawings and then redraw the whole thing into technical drawings. And he'll and he or she will look at every single piece uh, of of the structure of that piece of scenery if somebody has to go on it he'll look at loads and see what dynamic loads and try to put a factor of, of 10 fact safety factor of 10 on there um, and then look at it in terms of fi uh, finances and how much material is going to cost and then it, it becomes a yes or no question about whether or not that can actually be done uh, also there's some sometimes that automation is used and I'm hoping we're going to have some people on on this show to talk about theatrical and staging automation which I think would be a super interesting conversation um, and um, and so that that safety check system of the of the design coming in the technical director doing engineering drawings and the build the builders the carpenters all having a knowledge of how each weld works and how each each fastener is put together and then having it be double checked and tested before there's any um you know continuous use by the performers on it it's super 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 important and um sometimes the fine edge of of finance to safety feels like a, um, a question that should be asked but it's actually there's no question about it safety first Next question. 
Next one comes to us from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. When a theater performance is recorded, is it usually an edit of several performances? Go ahead, Richard. Uh, this is probably more to do with the level of kind of production. Is it a simple record? Is it a major, you know, uh, for, for a proper broadcast level record? Um, mostly, um, if you're starting out, it's going to be record of a single performance. Um, it's really very, very hard to match uh, live performance to each other unless you're very careful and you plan and also you get as well. It's generally a good rule of th filmmaking in general. Get as much B-roll as humanly possible uh, because it will save the day every single time. Uh, so never skimp on your B-roll. So it's, very, it's just very hard to match tone and pitch, especially in, in singing and other kind of uh, more musical side of things um, between different takes or different uh, productions. Um, certainly I've done it and, uh, and it's, it's definitely doable as a, as a practice, but you'll find at the entry level, it's mostly about capturing one performance as well as possible with as much coverage as you can, as many cameras and many angles and as much uh, uh, um, uh, material as you can. Uh, for that one performance. It's also quite a lot to set up a full record in a theatre. Um, so doing that across multiple nights is very difficult. Um, so again, um, if you if you want to, you can definitely do it, but it's 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 challenging. Talak? Yeah, so um, there's defi definitely multiple layers here. So one of the things is the different concerns in a theatre piece, which include the, the author of the play, you know, maybe the contemporary composer of the opera, the singers, the actors, um, the designers all have an interest um, to maybe get a little extra money if this is going to be utilized in in um, a, a DVD that they put out or, or if it's going to be streamed or whatever. It's not always necessary to get extra money, but you have to have that conversation. And sometimes orchestra unions are notorious for this. The answer is no. And so what you end up with is um, only being able to do an archival video of, of a particular production. Um, what I find interesting is that archival videos are getting more and more <laughs> complicated um, because I think that I think that they they really just like to have a good record of the piece. Um, but what 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 it, the range is from is a single camera uh, with a wide shot to multiple cameras with operators. And what I think seems to work the best is if you have isolated records of each camera, but that they were all going to a switcher and that there's a live edit of it um, so that, that that they can kind of get a feel for where things are. But then you have the, the isolated um, records at a higher quality and then there can be a final edit done because there are multiple reasons for these edits. Like there might be something uh, that can be used very quickly for in a dress rehearsal for marketing um, that came from the live edit. And then there might be something that is much more refined that will end up being a record that is uh, publicized. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, I was going to say exactly what Lalo said, but the the part that I was going to say is there's a technical side and then an emotional side as well. And so sometimes if you are just trying to record and or um, screen capture entrances and exits and the actual like blocking of a, a play that is the very technical side of like uh closed caption sometimes we'll have for a stage manager so that they can see when somebody enters so that they can call a cue like you will need those just pure technical recordings uh but then if you're trying to um convey the the feeling of the piece or the acting or the moments the uh, the the how it felt that's an entirely different thing uh and also to Lalo's points there's contractual obligations involved depending on where on that spectrum you land and matt yeah you, i'm not sure if this has changed but it used to be that equity would um, only allow for an archival recording which had to be a locked off camera and we've been doing bringing in videographers that have been doing multi-camera shoots and one that's more or less a wide shot but is able you know pan around and they'll use that for for b-roll the archival gets used for the understudies for them to learn the blocking of the different characters, 
um, you know, in the show so that they're prepared, you know, to go on. And so the, they'll come in and, and watch performances, but then they're not like locked in to have to be there like every night to try to pick up stuff. You can rewind the tape and go back. And that has to, the recording has to stay on, on premises. They can't take it home and work with it. Now, in a something that's meant to be broadcast, so like the Hamilton record, there were multiple recordings with audiences, and then they went in and did uh, empty theater uh, records so they could get on stage and get close-ups and uh, you know, you know, more intimate shots to incorporate into the overall edit. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, exactly what Matt said. When I've been asked to record theatrical performances, I always want to go at least three times. I want to know the shape of the show, what's going to happen. I want to try to do the dress rehearsal because that gives me more access to the stage. If there's an emotional high point and somebody breaks down, I don't want to do that from the back of the house. I want to do that from camera close position so that the audience is involved in the emotion of the character. And then when the audience is in place, obviously the audience is paid for tickets, so I have to stay out of their way. So I prefer to have those three options available so that I can do at least some capture of the heart of the play as well as what the audience sees as a proscenium shot. And Alex? Yeah, and as monitors and, and uh, screens and everything else become higher resolution and larger in size, uh, a lot of us are thinking about um, an, an experience rather than cutting the cameras is feeling like you're there. So if you're at home and you have a 100-inch monitor, 80-inch monitor, which some people do have, um, and uh, you want to frame it up. And what we're finding is, is that in some cases, you want to have just a single camera that's placed perfectly, sometimes two cameras if you want to do 3D. And, um, and you run them at, um, you run them right. If you think about the, the stage here, we have the, the camera up here. And as we frame it, we want to frame past the audience um, in there. But we actually, when we're framing them from the front, uh, we're framing the bottom of the stage here, the eye lines about here, and sometimes a wider to get, you know, obviously the rest of the set in there. But um, you can do a lot of other cameras, but that camera is becoming more and more important to us. So having that camera exist, you know, and maybe that's your, your you call that your safety shot, and you, but it, it's a very technical placement of that camera. But that camera by itself is becoming more and more important to us as we start to record more performances. Next question. Uh, looks like Tamara Pika in Los Angeles, California, says digital programming has been problematic with various unions. Have you dealt with those issues? Talak? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, one of the big things that we ran up against with opera is the orchestra unions. They're very, very, very um, uh, strict about that, about where things get recorded, where things get streamed, whether they get streamed. Um, and... I can see why. I mean, there's times when somebody will play a wrong note and then that would be in, in the recording forever. Um, but, but I think also what people are confronting with confronting is a new way of thinking is, a you know, the fact is that, that the world, the world likes to experience things digitally. And so it is a way I I'm hoping that some of these, some of these unions can see that this is a way to expand the possibility for theater rather than to contract it. And um, I, also, I also think that there are probably other, th other unions that have the jurisdiction of, of the digital world or the film world or the you know, visual on screen world that might be, say, well, now you're encroaching on ours. So there's a lot of conversation that is happening about this and trying to figure out how to make it elevate what we do in the theater and not detract from it, what anybody else is doing. Richard? Uh, yeah, just echo what uh, Talalok said. Um, it is a, it's, it's a very difficult area, um, but it's an area that will be solved in time and probably quite a short time. Um, uh, the, the main problem is that the audience is necessarily there for, for digital um, recordings or um, uh, art, you know, footage of a, of a live performance. Live is live, and most people understand that the digital is not a replacement to the live. They still want the live experience. It has primacy. But over time, that will shift um, as the audience and the expansion opportunities for, for, for digital will, will, will slowly come in. The finances will have to then adapt and at the moment everyone's kind of 
I'm a, in terms of financial, not necessarily in terms of bum, I've played a bum note, please don't release that. Um, the, the financial side is I don't want anyone making more money off my back uh, at the moment. Uh, so there's suspicion over, you know, the who owns it, where does it go, um, and, uh, and uh, who's making money off of that. And that will just all get kind of slowly negotiated and you know, uh, passed uh, on people to try different things and uh, and it will get sorted out over time. The main problem is that the audience isn't necessarily there. So as producers, well, in the conversations we've had, most people don't want to put the fork out a lot of money uh, at this stage to do a recording and do all the contractual needs that that uh, that come with that if they don't think they'll make at least a, a small return. Uh, and it's just going to take time. Matt? One issue that we ran into with one of the shows that we were doing during COVID was we wanted to make it available as a on-demand stream. And the rights issues from the publisher was our sticking point that we ended up negotiating uh, over several weeks and came down to agreement that you know we could only do it during the period of the run. And I think... Uh, we're able to get like a grace period of like one week after we closed uh, to run it. But the Sarasota Ballet at the same time was recording their pieces and because they've worked out the, the rights for the music that they use in the ballets, uh, we're, you know, cranking out pieces like uh, every every month. And Alex? Yeah, and, and the irony of a lot of this is that is that there's a lot of hustling going on for, for theater. And uh, part of the where money comes from is the ratio of actor to audience. You know, like, so when you get that, as that ratio increase, as the ratio increases, we have a larger and larger audience. And the easiest way to scale that audience, I mean, we look at a lot of times when we look at a venue, I I work in a thing where we have a virtual venue of about 60,000 people. And, uh, and, but the physical venue might be very small, <laughs> thousand people. And so we're starting to change that math. And that means those tickets become more available and so on and so forth to, to do that. And so, uh, so I think that that online has to keep growing um, because that actually makes it easier to do the theater, um, the live theater productions. I also think that we're going to see what happens in June uh, as Apple releases a higher performance uh, headset. Um, we definitely see you know, the big problem with the headsets have been lower resolution and lower uh, frame rate. Um, as that frame rate and, and resolution um, increase, there's a p potential of giving someone, putting them in the orchestra, you know, and having them sit in the perfect seat. In fact, a seat that probably doesn't exist in the real world. Um, they can sit in that seat that is the absolute perfect place where they hear everything perfectly and see everything perfectly and um, and experience a stage play in many ways the way it the way people envisioned it um, uh, you know in that in that process and we're very close now to to that experience happening and that's going to be massive it's going to create a massive scale and Talak. I just wanted to finalize and f follow up by saying sometimes the interests uh, at hand, like for example, the rights organizations that hold the rights to the theater piece, to the to the play, are making decisions in the contract that are very short-sighted. And so we were allowed, for example, during the um, pandemic to do ver a variety of plays in terms of the rights, but they dictated what our um, presentation platform was, what venue we had to use, uh, I think we called it show ticks or something like that. We had to use show ticks. And whenever you do that, and we've talked a lot about this on this show, when you when you make a decision in a vacuum like that, um, it, it really can hurt the end product. So I, 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 that's one thing I would push back on on a lot of these things is when they're working on 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 making these contractual things, they should not say that you have to use, you know, um, uh, a particular kind of cable. Just put it that way. And just a reminder to our producers, please go ahead and vote on the questions because we do have a lot of them, which means we just have to have this conversation again. But for the remainder of the show, your votes matter. Next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. Many performing arts organizations share or sell their subscriber databases with each other. Is this all about marketing costs? Is this a necessity to survive financially? I don't like getting those unsolicited ads. Richard. Um, this is um, 
Well, this is illegal in the EU, um, essentially, uh, at the moment uh, under GDPR. Um, I would, my, my initial reaction to this question was that I would run away from any organization that did that. They're kind of cutting them themselves off at the knees uh, for a very short term uh, fix. But it also depends on what the nature of the, 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 the question is. Is it that they're sharing marketing resources in that they've pulled and they've, they have one marketing unit that's doing multiple theatres or are they literally giving their email and user data to other theatres to, to then share? Um, they, they shouldn't do it um, in Europe for definite. Hey, US could be different. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, but even if even outside the EU, um, they should really, really not be sharing people's data. It's just going to basically um, turn people off from ever joining your uh, organization uh, as, as, as a member or as a subscriber. Your relationship with your audience is key and it's not the same as your relationship as, as another venue's relationship with their audience. You're, it's not just about blasting 10,000, 15,000 people with an email. It's about having a conversation with your audience and developing that relationship um, so that you are programming what is suitable for them and you're providing, just like YouTube, a, a need, a, a service to that user. Uh, and just sharing uh, contacts is, is madness. Mad. Go ahead, Bill. Well, the U.S. being a capitalist system, uh, th there is a lot of this. And I will tell you just a, a quick story. Uh, I used to work for a company that sold Cadillacs, and we would do broadcasting, but we would also do narrow casting, which was look for people who own Buicks, because we knew that 90% of the people who were going up to a Cadillac were coming from something in that class of cars directly below it. So the effectiveness of your marketing dollars do skyrocket if you can pre-qualify the people you're sending a promotional type thing to, rather than just blasting it out to everybody and getting a tiny, tiny percentage. Yes, I agree with Richard entirely that it can be done badly and you can burn out an audience by constantly badgering them, please come to this theater event because you came to another theater event and I got your name and they are wildly divergent things that you would not be interested in. But for an organization that is financially strapped, that idea of pre-qualifying and marketing to groups who are more likely rather than less likely to want to see your ad is very powerful. And Talak. I mean, my recommendation to these companies is stop sending out any of it and put some people in the, in the streets talking about, this, about what they're doing and showing what they're doing. Do pop-up theater, do pop-up opera. It's the only thing that I've seen work and it's worked in a beautiful, beautiful way where you're, you're filling the seats with, with a community that, that all of a sudden is going to band around your, your company for many, many years and start to support it um, as one of their own. Next question. Harshid Trevidi of Daytona Beach, Florida says, recently I heard a theater in Winter Garden now including audio description for their productions. What are your thoughts on adding audio describers to your local theaters? Ali? Well, 15, uh, I do a lot of research on um, accessibility for people with disabilities in theater. And 15% uh, of the world's population has a disability. So like as performing arts groups have a moral obligation <laughs> to be providing more access uh, to all groups. Um, the fact that we're trying to, we're talking about putting people in the audience. Well, there's a whole section of people have, that have had no access to theater and the arts for a long time because we failed to address anyone's access needs. Um, UK is much better about this than the US has been, but we, uh, and we have so much more work to do. So any sort of services that a theater um, and a performing arts group can provide um, are welcome and necessary. So things like audio description, um, uh, closed captioning, open captions, um, sensory friendly performances. This is especially important in children, uh, theater for young audiences. These are all like absolute necessities and need to be bud budgeted um, in theater and performing arts budgets uh, to have um, accessibility designers on hand to create uh, 
um, accessible performances and also have conversations with the disability community in their area so that they're providing um, services that uh, are asked for and are working with partners in the community to um, get the spread the word and um, uh, make sure that they're uh, part of the whole uh, creation of um, accessibility program for your arts organization. Talak? Yeah, I think it's super important. And I think, um, you know, some theaters have more infrastructure available to make that happen. And so that there can be an audio description from, you know, a, an audio description booth to a headset and others don't have that. Um, uh, as well as sometimes um, one of the great things that I've seen, and I really, really love it because, you know, in opera, um, people with, with a limited sight can still hear this beautiful piece. So what they, what, what they do is they, they have a performance where they bring people in a little bit early and they can come up on stage and touch everything on stage and feel what things feel like and where things are and what the size is and kind of get a, get a sense of it. And then they sit in their seats and they listen to and experience the thing, the, 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 the experience. And it's a really great thing. So hopefully more of that happens. Hopefully more uh, audio description happens. There's um, one opera I did that included uh, ASL in the opera, as well as having an ASL uh, of the, um, of the show itself. Next question. Next one comes to us from Alexander Knight in Vancouver, British Columbia. And Alexander says, do you see more local theaters investing in infrastructure to be able to live stream and sell tickets online? Are there any successful cases where the return on investment was worth it? Talak? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, but it's not just for selling tickets. It, this is the sort of thing that we need to, we need to break the model. And uh, my experience is very, I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to do this quickly, but Opera Delaware, I helped them as well as some other people helped them get a full set, set up and, and they went, oh, this is too much, too much. And I said, no, get more. <laughs> and they got more. And so now they have this whole studio space with three, four PTZ, three PTZ cameras with an ATEM Extreme ISO um, and with some lighting. And they went, oh, this is great. We can stream our galas um, and we get more donations that way. They said, oh, and we have, we're in a, in a time of post-COVID situation where we can now stream quality versions of our rehearsals. And the, the, we, don't have to, we don't have to travel, bring in and, and pay for travel for the understudies because they're watching, all, watching and listening to all of it on stream or on Zoom or on, on YouTube, actually on YouTube. And so they can they can wait until that understudy is actually needed to come uh, to, to 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 bring them in, and and it has completely transformed their, the way they work. And they are now thinking about they have a black box and the studio space. And they are thinking about getting the entire system again for their black box. It just changed their world. And Richard, yeah, it's a it's a interesting i've also given the example at the top of the hour of, of us but just as talalok says it's not just about shows it's about a larger ecosystem so what we're tending to see is that um, venues and organizations aren't necessarily investing in equipment they're investing in people to come in so more and more digital officers are being appointed so that the holistic approach to both interviews connect you know Getting artists on uh, on camera uh, for for social media for connection to to their audience for giving the audience a reason to care about different productions that's really increasing um, uh, and, and it already it already was a large part of a lot of lots of businesses for streaming shows that then depends to, often depends upon what the nature of the venue is so it's much easier to stream music events than it is to to stream checkoff um, it's much easier to stream a new play by a new playwright than it is to stream uh, Pinter. Uh, that's always going to come down to the rights and it's always going to come down to the, the, the size of the production at the, and, the, and then the scale. Um, so generally, um, this is a, a growing area, but it, it's, it's still as a, it, it, it kind of in its infancy. This has been a fantastic conversation and worthy of multiple second hours so that we can dive even deeper into more of the verticals. And I do want to give you each of you like 15 seconds a piece to just what's what's next in the space? What should we be keeping our eye on? And you can pick either one of those just to close us out. 
Talak? Yeah, I think just keep an eye out for um, the ever increasing sort of embracing of the technology and of the digital space and keep an eye out for the opposite of that, the intimate small space where you're in the room with somebody, whether it's it's one of those, the, the lowest latency versions of communicating with human beings. And so, you know, let's see what happens. Kyle? Uh, I was going to say uh, thank you five is our show where we continue this conversation. Uh, it's a straw dog show where five theater artists come on and talk about what is theater and how is it developing and how is it changing in this digital landscape. Uh, so that happens every Wednesday night. And we're also looking for volunteers to help on the back end office hours. So let's talk. Matt. Uh, I think the, what streaming is, you know, is a lot of, uh, you know, People that like Twalock that are not on, on in the location until the end are able to get in and see the rehearsal process and, and be part of that rather than just living you know, through the rehearsal reports. So that's like one of the things that's coming out of this. I get a feeling that we're going to go back to the old ways and it as far as like your uh, broadcasting or streaming you know, productions, it's going to be a really uh, hard pull to, to to get that in at least my neck of the woods. Go ahead, Allie. For me, my interest and where I think the industry is going to be increasingly heading towards is um, immersive performance uh, and then also incorporating more uh, virtual reality and augmented reality into performances as well. And that's where I'm investing my um brain power in and hoping uh, that's going to pay off for my students as well. And Richard. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with Ali. Immersive performance. Um, Accident was actually an immersive theatre company before we became a building. Um, immersive performance is huge and it's a complete game changer um, uh, for, for how people relate and interact with, with theatre as, as an art form. Um, one of the questions we didn't get to was Douglas's about, you know, is theatre audience older and how do we kind of make it younger? And um, I'm often the oldest person at some of our events. So theatre is not for, for old people. Um, it's usually there's an economic reason and that's going to completely change just as what Alex said today as well. As the audience grows larger online, so the ticket price can then change and the access um, that you now have as an opportunity to support theatre companies like Straw Dogs, you can then you know, connect with them from anywhere in the world at any time of the day. That kind of access and artistic opportunity is going to be incredibly interesting and theater has always been one of those art forms that that adapts to technology really really quickly much quicker than any other art form tala kyle matt ali uh richard thank you so much for this conversation and to our producers thank you for all of your questions great questions hopefully you'll be able to go into after hours and continue the conversation and of course to our panel for your contributions and your insights and our back ed team for without which this would not be possible and now tomorrow we'll be talking about live camera and lens tracking for virtual production and if you want to learn more about the schedule for the week head over to office hours.global and we have traveled i got to bring it a little bit closer to be here because we've traveled so far 43,088 miles and that is 69,343 kilometers that's more than 341 million bananas and 1.7 times around the earth thank you so much for watching and we will see you next time bye So I decided to be part of the whispering. The yes. whispering. I haven't whispered. You haven't gotten the whispers yet. I haven't gotten the whisper. Welcome to the whispering. I'll see if I can dig out my nano controller and see if we can figure out how to get you going, Alex. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll do an after hours little lab. We'll get Chris and you and a whole bunch of us and we'll plug it in and spend an hour or two working on that next week. This week I'm traveling, so it's going to be harder. Soon. That sounds great, though. Fantastic show all. Thank you. Yeah, that was great.